my name is Lerato Masilane, as you guys can see in the top right here on my right. And uh, yeah, so I'm one of the practice heads at DVT, uh, specifically in the mobile space. Um, and um, I want to introduce Michael as well. And uh, before I introduce Michael, so I just wanted to, to just maybe maybe speak about what Michael's going to talk about, right? So Michael, I believe your talk is around it's geared more towards developers, right? So, and leveraging AI capabilities in terms of their day to day, in terms of how they develop software, and just having that assistant, right? Having that um, um, that 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 buddy that you can code with that can help you become a lot more productive, etc. And I believe that you're going to be covering some tools that are helpful for developers, so current tools and also tools that we can look out for in the future. That that's going to be quite helpful. So I'm hoping that we do have quite a number of developers here. And after the presentation, that will have a lot of great questions coming from the floor as well. I know I'm certainly excited. I've been out of the dev game for a while, but it's always good to know um, what's current, what's happening. Uh, and I think it makes for interesting conversations with some of our clients as well in terms of what value can be derived from some of these tools and how they can actually leverage them to increase productivity and ultimately you know, increase revenue for their businesses. But yeah, I did say that I will introduce who Michael is. So Michael is one of our gurus here at DBT. He is a practice lead in the Microsoft space. Um, Michael, I know you, you, you're quite a genius. So you've been, you've been working across various industries, across healthcare, and now you're in consulting. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your journey in terms of how you ended up at DBT and how you ended up in this space. Uh, so maybe just in 30 seconds, tell us how, how it is that you got here. Yeah, I often call myself an accidental developer. Um, I have worked in a number of fields. Originally, I started out in, in accountancy, I moved into finance and logistics and e-commerce. But somehow, wherever I went, I always found myself getting pulled onto the uh, the technical side. And I just had this flair for writing code and seeing systems and putting in procedures and just making sure things run efficiently. And the easiest way to, I guess, embrace that or utilize that skill was to, to code things. So for me, it was like a bit of an organic growth into development. And I mean, as part of my role in DVT, I do everything from rolling up my sleeves to jump into those giant balls of mud or big balls of spaghetti and, and get things working. But also just to help the, the company navigate the, its, its technical future. And that's especially important in uh, this day and age of AI. And this talk, uh, so Lerato, absolutely, it probably leans more towards developers. But there's a lot in here for anyone who's not a developer, just wants to get, like, what do I do with this AI thing? Where is it going? And basically, can can I help people with their, their technical strategy, especially on the, the, the AI front? Yeah, so, thanks. Thanks for that, Michael. Yeah, and 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 Michael, sorry, I just I just wanted to maybe ask you two or three personal questions, right? Just uh, for our audience, just to get to know you a little bit as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Outside of the tech space, yeah, I just wanted to know, like, if you could travel anywhere in the world right now, Michael, like, where where would you travel to, and and why that specific area? Uh, straight to the mountains. That's uh, kind of where my heart is, and it just the thing I like about the, the mountains is they'll be there long before any of this tech stuff. They're going to be there long after all of this tech stuff. And it's just one place where you just kind of be yourself. Yeah. And specifically, I mean, I know you get mountains with cell phone reception, but my choice is <laughs> just go where somewhere where no one can get hold of you. And I'll use the cliche, be one with nature. But it's just really about, for me, I find I get the most done is when I can move away from the noise and the clutter of the day-to-day -day work life going to the mountains and somehow my mind just has this ability just to like reset itself. And I've probably saw some of my biggest challenges when I'm in that mindset. Um, hence, I'm going to motivate now to move my office into the mountains. Ah, love it. Yeah. And then just just two more. I mean, what's um, what's the most memorable event that you've ever attended? I'm, I'm sure you've attended like millions of events, right? Especially being the space that you're in. You attend a lot of events, but I just wanted to, to know from you what's the most memorable one that you ever attended to date. So interestingly, it wasn't in the, the tech space. It is back in 2019, I had the absolute privilege of traveling to Zermatt in Switzerland. And there I was able to participate in the Air Zermatt Air Rescue program. 
So I had the joy of flying around the, the Alps in a helicopter for five days. Oh, nice. And that was just, yeah, absolute, probably my single most memorable uh, experience. Yeah. And finally, I think you might have been asked this question before, but if you had to write a book about your life, Michael, um, what would be the most appropriate title for that book? I would just go learn from my mistakes. That would be ah. the title. Okay, I love it. I love it. No, thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think we can get the talk underway. I'm sure a lot of people are excited to hear what it is that you have to share. So, yeah, take it away for us. Okay, awesome. So, today's talk is titled Navigating the Future of AI and Software Development. And before we carry on, I do have to qualify this. It is given that AI is such a fast moving area, um, I wouldn't take any of call my predictions in this uh, further ahead than a, a month or so. Is I've just found from my personal experience, um, it's just changing literally from week to week. So one has to be very careful about choosing how a company wants to embrace AI or as a developer, like which, uh, which AI path or which AI technology do I want to embrace? So my journey so far it goes back quite a while uh, way back into the early days of machine learning when i say early days we are probably talking like the uh like 2010 and that's uh many lifetimes ago in, in ai ai years um started looking at our decision trees early machine learning language uh, then moved on to advanced indexing techniques and pretty much wherever i was coding anything where my mind goes is how can this work better? How can this work faster? What edge can I give my clients uh, in terms of either software that we're delivering? And I'm one of those developers is I would quite happily spend eight hours automating a task that otherwise would only have taken me one hour to do. And the areas that I focus on a lot back into the early days, I mean, of even Microsoft uh, SharePoint search, I spend a lot of time looking at lexical search improvements, just really hard to extract more data and value insights out of documents. And then one day we had this uh, amazing tool uh, called ChatGPT, or actually the, the amazing tool is the, the large language model underneath that. And from there, I mean, everyone on this call, I'm sure has seen the, the rapid evolution of the amount of tools. And obviously myself being predominantly in the Microsoft space, I was one of the early adopters of GitHub Copilot. When it first started, I thought, okay, this is this is cute. Wasn't a huge help, but I'm now proud to say that I, I eat my words on that statement in that GitHub Copilot and I, we are fully integrated as I literally cannot live without GitHub Copilot anymore. And the thing I like about it now is it's just seamless in my environment. Um, from the obviously GitHub Copilot, it's, I guess you could say it's very sandboxed in my environment. It doesn't have insights into all my work. And so often I've been doing something and I thought, no, nah, I've done this. I've had this requirement before. I've done this code, but I sit and I rack my brain where in the hundreds of repositories that I have can I find this code that I did. And eventually I just give up, go to chat GPT, go to Copilot, and I just end up rewriting it. So where I would like a co-pilot to be is just to have insights into all the work that I've ever done and just help me sort of be a bit more broad sweeping in terms of a, a tool. Then sort of as we progress now, I work very heavily with um, Azure OpenAI, uh, again, focusing mostly on the Microsoft space, but I also take a lot of time to step out of the Microsoft space go and look at large language models like you know, Llama, your Pinecone databases, spend a lot of time trawling through Hugging Face, see what's new there. But just really trying to understand what is out there and to try foolishly or not make predictions on where DBT and our clients should go in terms of, of AI. Because all you know, there's just been this rapid development and a lot of this has been fueled by the explosive growth in computing power. So if you look at the amount of resources needed to run these uh, computers, I mean, they now 
I'll say inventing new types of processes. Microsoft has launched its new uh, AI uh, laptops. And another thing that's really driving AI is the just the availability of big data. People have been collecting data for, I mean, decades now. And I remember on many occasions having a discussion or discussions with clients asking, do we really need to log all this information? And I think on more than one occasion, someone told me, you know, we're doing it for just in case. Like one day we might need this data for something. We don't know what it is. And lo and behold, I mean, that day, if it's not here already, it'll be here very soon where these companies can now go take AI models and consume all this big data that they've actually been collecting for the, the last couple of decades. Um, there's also the one thing that I like about a lot of the AI models is obviously it's open source. And to that end, there's a lot of contributions, um, collaboration, and a lot of explainability and visibility into these models, which just helps, I think, people, clients, developers. They just feel a lot more comfortable knowing what they're using. They have these incredibly powerful tools, but they are more than welcome or able to go into the code bases and just try to get some idea of how these uh, these tools are actually working for them. And another big thing is obviously there's been huge investments in funding, and that is driving this technology. Um, so if anyone thinks that AI is just going to be a flash in the pan, as I don't think so. And I base that just obviously having insights into uh, investments into this area, see the growth, having discussions with clients. And AI now is an inextricable part of many, many large companies' strategies. So part of my role, as I mentioned, is advising clients, where do we start with AI? Like, how do we get going? And the general advice is to just start, but start small, do experiments, and just generally get the people within the company, whether it's technical or non-technical staff, just get them comfortable using AI. And of course, get as much feedback as you can. And like with any software, you don't want to take this big bang approach invent these massive products that nobody's going to end up using or they end up not being very um, fit for purpose and take baby steps. And with those baby steps, you'll take bigger steps and eventually you'll just naturally find that you're on this, uh, the, the correct AI path. So in my mind, okay, there's many considerations for AI within the company, but the three main ones that I, I find as a, a common theme or have a look at how you want to use AI within your company. And if you are, in fact, any type of company, whether you're producing actual goods, software, uh, in manufacturing, you want to see how can you leverage AI either within your products or to enhance your products. And of course, if you happen to decide that for whatever the nature of your company, that you just don't need it within the company, your products, they don't need AI either. You do need to consider the impact of AI within your environment. Is And what I mean by that is you need to consider all your competitors um, using AI to enhance their products, to enhance their processes. Or is AI in fact changing the environment? And a consequence of that is that you may actually change your consumers' uh, sort of notions and ideas, which may impact um, the, the products or services that they um, they acquire from you. Now, an interesting uh, part of DVT's journey is we've been working on a company chatbot. And honestly, I took on the task, and I thought this will be easy, just take an LLM, let's throw some data into it and you'll start getting, it'll be done and over quickly. But we, we quickly heard, learned that getting the chatbot to behave exactly the way that we wanted, it was very similar to herding cats. And within our first few our, our early stages of testing, we found that this wasn't quite giving us the answers that we want. I mean, all our answers were great. They were technic technically correct but they just weren't 
what either myself or the the other leadership within DVT wanted to see. And this was actually a very serious thing because this chatbot is going to represent the company and it has to be correct. Um, so we've uh, ended up just moving away from just a pure large language model. And we've had to do quite a few, I guess I'll say technical innovations to only now start getting the LLM to behave exactly the way that we want. And we just find there's a very delicate balance between normal coding. And I can suddenly hear a whole lot of developers who are worried about the impact of AI is you've got to remember that AI relies on coding. And so we now have to balance normal coding with technology, but producing this product in such a way that it will embrace and grow with the, this rapid release of new AI tools. And Michael, maybe if I may interject there, um, I just wanted to ask you in terms of that that AI bot that you spoke about for DVT, right? I just wanted to know from you, like, what's the, what's the biggest lesson that you'd say you've learned, or we as DVT have learned um, from from this sort of implementation? A key takeaway that we can probably share with some of our customers. What was uh, the biggest lesson out of that? And before you answer, I just want to mention this is something I didn't mention in the beginning, but if anybody has a question. Please uh, make use of the Q and A. If you look at the at the top of your screen, there there should be a Q and A button, so you can just make use of that and ask your questions, and then Michael will address them uh, towards the end. Thanks, Michael. Cool. So the biggest lesson learned, or at least for me, is AI is not a magic wand. If you treat it like a magic wand, you are going to be very severely disappointed. And what uh, when you first started out with the the large language model, so we used Azure um, Azure OpenAI. Is all I did was say, hey, where's the website? Let me just scrape that, and I literally just threw the contents of the website into the LLM and give me answers. But now the issue is as great as the DBT website looks. I quickly learned that is designed for human consumption. And the bots had very different ideas about this data it was receiving. And I have to admit, one of the best things was it gave some very comical answers, information which was completely wrong. And when we went and checked the website, well, hang on, did this thing just was a website wrong? The website's perfect. But it was just the way the data was passed into the large language model, the way it was interpreted and the answer it gave. It just wasn't representing DVT properly. So to that end, we really had to sort of pull in the reins. It became a massive data cleansing exercise. Um, there's a, a ton of considerations that have to go into building your own uh, chatbot. And or should I say a chatbot with an LLM behind it. And we actually implement like three different technologies now. And only now are we getting the, the results that we want. And um, probably within the next, uh, I guess, sort of month or two. Uh, there will be a whole bunch of other technologies in there to enable the chatbot to do things like you now send emails, facilitate downloads, on some more advanced queries, private queries. So you're back into the normal software development life cycle and AI is just forming a, a tool. But anyway, back to my lesson learned is don't just throw data at the chatbot or any LLM or AI in general, is you have to follow the normal software development processes and avoid the whole garbage in garbage out um, type of dilemma. Yeah, thanks for that, Michael. You, you've raised quite a number of uh, key points, but I'll bring those up at the end as in the form of questions. So yeah, I think please continue. Thanks. Absolutely. So actually funny story when I was putting this slide together and I, I threw Devon 1.0 is I suddenly heard a thousand developers all cracking their knuckles at the same time. Uh, Devon is just one of those things. Some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, I've seen videos where it goes ahead and creates and deploys entire websites on its own. I've seen all the videos that debunk Devon 1.0. But my point is, or that I'd like to just make on Devon, is it happened. Someone went out there, they put the code together. And like with any technology, the first version, as brilliant as it may be, is usually not the best. But the thing is, it opened the door for this type of development. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more. 
Now, some of the other things, as I mentioned, our journey with the DVT chatbot, that was just a large language model. Um, but to get AI to really work well for you is you need to give it very specific tasks. And to that end, a couple of things have been released, Langchain, uh, Function Calling, Autogen. These are all tools or frameworks that allow you to take a simple task, essentially break it up into multiple smaller tasks, but then give each of those smaller tasks to an AI model designed to handle that type of query. You could have, for example, a financial one, one that answers questions about clients, um, one that can get information about you know, how to fix something, user guides, and so on. And the trend that I'm seeing is from Devon, because these are all, they're not all the same thing, they don't all serve the same purpose. But where it's going is the tooling around the AI models is getting smarter and smarter and allowing developers and companies to do a lot more, I guess, intelligent tasks. Now, here's an interesting quote. As much as we criticize the flaws in current AI tools, we must acknowledge their remarkable achievements and functionality. Given the unprecedented rate of development, the next version is promised to be exponentially better and more transformative. And so if you want to know who said that quote is, I'll just ask ChatGPT to give me one. I'm looking at some of these specific tools. So I'll leave Devon 1.0. It's relatively old technology. But I do encourage any developers, go to YouTube, search Devon 1.0, watch some of the demos, and obviously form your own opinions. I'm more than happy to, to discuss any of that with, with anyone. Uh, now, at its core, Autogen is really, it's a framework, and it allows AI agents to converse with one another, very similar to, to Langchain, uh, which is another open source technology. And this is useful for environments where users might require anything from simple to deeply technical answers. So if you look at the, um, so here's your conversable agent. If the agent feels that it can't answer a question or is out of its expertise or it hasn't got access to the data, typically your answer would be something like, no, I can't answer, I don't have that information. But in this environment here, the agent will know all the other agents in its realm. So you might have the, call it your front desk agent, and it may get a query, say, again, I'll use the uh, financial, financial information. And if a user had permission, it might then go off to, let's call that one the, the financial services agent. And it will get all the information back, and then it will come back to you with a response. But that response is not data in, data out. It was actually constructed through multiple conversations between the agents. And that will then determine the correct answer to give you. So Autogen, really, it's uh, it wraps its task tools and memory. And what it does is it has things called, a, it will create a, a plan for you. It will have access to certain memory or certain data. That data, depending on how you structure, will obviously have the necessary permissions. You don't want clients finding about information about other clients or financials or sensitive information like that. And basically what Autogen will do is it just orchestrates all your requests. Uh, it creates plans for you. It can interact with uh, other APIs. Uh, there's a graph API. Developers, you can write native functions to work with this. And through this, I found that you can create these very powerful AI applications, which, again, in this context, they not only necessarily do one thing. And again, back to here's your single agent. So your single agent performs very specific tasks, you know, like uh, co-generation or project analysis. In fact, co-pilot you could think of as a, a single agent. And this is based on the user needs applicable in areas like you get like smart homes, autonomous driving, and so on.
Then we have the multi AI agents. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, this is where the agents interact to complete highly collaborative tasks. And this is very beneficial in software development, intelligent production, and enterprise management. And as I mentioned to Lorato right at the beginning of this, a lot of the technology to do all these amazing things are in place. We just have to get people more comfortable in using them and understanding how all this stuff comes together. For me, sometimes I do get this unsettling feeling where I get a result that's just too quick. And one of my first experiences around that was when using uh, GitHub Copilot is I needed to write a unit test. I literally typed two characters on the screen and it produced probably about a dozen high quality, um, very efficient unit tests on my code. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't recreate that experience. I, I find I still have to tweak and uh, um, change my, my unit test quite a bit. But I just always think back to that first experience. And whenever we develop or we as developers are creating these AI uh, products, we need to take into account that users just might be, need a little bit of time to, to get used to it. And as a developer, creating these AI products, I've just found that it, it requires a different mindset to your normal if then else type coding, is you really have to understand the underlying technology, how these things work, if you want to produce very high quality um, AI products. Now we're sort of getting um, towards the more advanced AI tools. The one that I'm working with quite extensively now is the Microsoft Semantic Kernel. And this really underpins many of the AI products that you see or work with today. So Semantic Kernel and Autogen are both Microsoft technologies, but each of these serves different uh, purposes. The Semantic Kernel SK, as it's referred to, this is an open source um, SDK, and it allows developers to build AI agents that can call existing code. So we're getting into the realm of very powerful, we're not just doing chatbots anymore. We're now unleashing AI on your code and potentially on the, the rest of the world. One of the core concepts within the SK are what they call planners. And our planners in the semantic kernel orchestrate sequences of actions to achieve specific goals. And how it does this is to leverage the kernel's advanced natural language understanding and its contextual processing capabilities. And again, having been on top of LLMs right from the inception, I have noticed that there's been definite uh, improvements in how the LLMs understand your requests and give responses. And I've even had success in asking it to design databases, give me scripts, and it really is starting to understand the, the context of what you need. Another aspect of the kernel are plugins. And this is where I actually have a, a huge amount of fun is designing plugins for AI. And this is really where you're designing something like a tool to send an email, uh, provision a database, run a pipeline. But you program it in such a way that the AI takes control of it and it will conduct um, that function for you. So the plugins, so these again, they're just modular components that they can enhance your whatever AI product you are creating. It can enhance the core system's functionality and adds very specialized features and lets you link with external tools and services. So interesting, before I started using the semantic kernel is I tried to trick the LLM into giving me a response or to trigger a process. And as I mentioned, my book, Learn From My Mistakes, is don't ever try a trick an LLM. They are, unfortunately, they're just too unpredictable. OK, so up until now, I've just been talking about this is also co-pilot and coding stuff. And the next question is, where's the magic? So unfortunately, the, the, there is no magic. We're just getting into more and more advanced and complicated tools. But Microsoft released a research, well, this is a research project called Autodev. 
And to my understanding, or at least as of last night, this is not something you can go and spin up and try out. Now in the auto dev environment, here we have, this is an eval environment. This is a controlled setting and a strong emphasis on controlled is where the performance and effectiveness of the AI or the auto devs AI agents are tested. So under the hood, auto dev, I'll, I'll use the word autonomous. This can, in theory, create an entire project from your unit test, your codes, provision databases, make sure everything's working. But obviously that code needs to land somewhere. And obviously with AI safety ever present in my mind, this eval environment runs in a Docker container, so it's completely isolated from the world. In here, um, this ensures that everything is standardized. There's an isolated context to measure the capabilities. And in the, the research paper, everything that's going on in here is benchmarked against things like the human eval data set, just to make sure like is what is being produced of the same quality as um, you would consider a, a human developer to do. Um, now, in the context of auto dev, conversations refer to the interactions between AI agents and the system's components to perform tasks. Now, as developers or even project managers, delivery managers, everyone understands the complexity of a software project. And that's always been the spark of debate that AI will never get, there's just too much going on. But again, AI is developing in a very methodical stepwise fashion. And all those complexities are being broken down. Everything is getting ring fenced. The tests will be in the test area. Files will be delivered there, tests will be run. That in process, um, AI is starting to handle that better and better. And my opinion, it can only get better and more advanced from here. Now, again, in the context of Autodev, all of the AI agents are powered by large language models. And again, learning from our mistakes, not all the LLMs are created equal. Some are even free, some are very expensive, uh, relatively speaking. <laughs> but these agents, excuse me, leverage the capabilities of LLMs to understand and generate natural language. They are extremely good at code synthesis and execute like various development tasks with, with great ease. The LLMs enable the agents to interpret the user inputs. And once again, playing with the and developing a chatbot, the saying garbage in, garbage out, I mean, it, it, it rules, is if you want an AI to develop you a software system, you have to give it very specific instructions to tell it exactly what you need, and then you'll find that it'll start to perform um, very well. So just an, another overview of the, the Autodev framework. The tools library provides a very versatile set of commands that AI agents use to perform various operations on a code base. So these are not tools for developers, but these are tools for um, your AI agent. And once set up and configured, you'll find that you can obviously, if you have a certain I guess, criteria or requirements for your code base within a company, all of that can be configured within these tools. Now, these commands include things like file editing, retrieval, build and execution, testing and validation, Git operations. And I did mention earlier that everything happens in a very contained environment, is you have the choice of limiting those Git commits to your local, or if you wanted it to go into something like GitHub or some remote uh, repository. These tools break up the complex task of software development, and they abstract the complex actions into very simple commands. And this enables the AI agents to interact with the repository efficiently and effectively, again, within a secure Docker environment. Now, this tools library is crucial for seamless execution of automated software development tasks, which really enhance the capabilities and flexibility of the Autodev framework. 
A uh, couple of other important things are the rules and actions. So rules that define your constraints and enforce adherence to best practices. So you're not unleashing AI on your code, is it will have the guidelines and parameters to produce the code of the quality that you would expect from your normal developers. Actions are specific tasks performed by AI agents, such as code retrieval, editing, building, testing, and literally anything within the SDLRC. And as I mentioned earlier, the more granular tasks you give AI, you'll find the, the better, better it performs. Uh, so overall, uh, your objectives. So your user will provide the objectives to, to your AI model. And these guide the actions of the AI agents to achieve desired outcomes, like completing features, fixing bugs, or generating documentation, ultimately enhancing developer productivity. And any developers on the call, I'm sure you've had the, the experience where you've just spent many nights or days feverishly producing code, only to be told, actually, no, the requirements was not correct. So you have to go back and change a whole bunch of stuff. The thing I'm looking forward to the most is producing code, getting a change requirement or a change request, and simply going back to the uh, Autodesk framework and saying, actually, can you just change this for me? And it will run off in the background and just reconfigure everything, all the tests, do all the deployments, um, so that burden of or the very repetitive coding work, I'm very much looking forward for all of that to, to going away. So this is Dolly e. uh, asked it uh, just to create an image. Do I think we will ever get to a situation where I can simply give a command like this to this magic uh, AI machine or box? Give it a command that will say create a perfect app. Um, I don't think we'll be here anytime soon. I do think this is feasible. If you give whichever AI tool, framework, um, whatever technology might come in the future, if you gave it access to every bit of information it needed, so you would have to give it insights to the clients, Hard runs business, hard runs its business, hard runs its finances, who all their clients are, what their clients need, um, how you want to cut. So if you gave it all the data that it could possibly need, I think potentially you could get there where you could create the perfect app through a simple command. But that just gives me a bit of an unsettling feeling uh, to give it that much uh, access to that much data. But uh, I don't want to go down the, the path of uh, conspiracy theories just yet. Uh, a question I get asked a lot is, as a developer, is my job safe? Now, we often pass around the saying is, AI won't take your job, but the person who embraces AI will take their job, and we can certainly unpack that. But where I see this going, and this is a, a new area of employment that AI is actually creating, and these are termed AI supervisors. An AI supervisor or a human overseer, as I've heard it called, is crucial in the context of Autodev or any uh, AI framework that will ultimately create um, these complex systems. The supervisor will ensure that the user inputs are clear, again, prevent that garbage in, garbage out situation, that user input must be precise and well-defined, which in turn enhances the quality of the outputs. Now, I'm sure you will have all heard that prompts, whether you're using ChatGPT, uh, Gemini, whichever other LLM is out there, is the quality of your prompt will determine your success in the response. The same thing will apply to de developing these systems. <clears throat> these AI supervisors will also provide guidance. They will clarify requirements. Um, they will review the AI-generated results and, again, make sure that these are meeting all the requirements that will execute properly. There's nothing dangerous in there, nothing that will cause your manager to get a phone call from an angry client at 3 a.m. in the morning. And they'll just make sure that the entire development process remains aligned with the project goals and, of course, your company goals and your client goals. This oversight helps bridge the gap between human intent and machine execution. So 
is going to be a collaborative environment where AI can operate effectively and efficiently. And as I mentioned in the earlier slide is I'm looking forward to the, the drudgery of coding going away and very much look forward to my newfound AI supervision tasks where you can just sort of validate the output, help train these AI models and just really move on to the, the call it the, the next era of software development. Um, that said, um, I'll hand over back to Lorata. Thank you, Michael. That was a great presentation. I think, guys, let's give him a round of applause. Um, yeah, and then we, we can jump into questions. So remember, you can you can post your questions in the Q&A. Um, I also did pop a question there, and it was mainly targeted to the floor, right? So everybody that's attending, yeah, what I wanted to know was if anybody on this call has used any of the tools that Michael has spoken about um, in his presentation. And what was your experience of those tools and if you would recommend them? So if anybody has, um, yeah, Karen, can they just put up their hands and then they can be allowed to speak? Or you can just type it in the in the in the Q and A as well. Yeah, I see Damien's got his hand up. Yeah, Damien, go for it. Maybe muted by default. Oh, okay. Let me. You, you can you can you can speak now, Damien. Okay. We can hear you. Give it a try. Oh, there we go. Now I've got to unmute myself as well. OK, thanks for the presentation, Michael. Um, yeah, it's just very exciting stuff. Look, I haven't fiddled around too much with anything outside of Copilot, but I can most definitely talk to the, the power of Copilot and what it's done for me in my role. Um, it's quite dramatic. So, you know, just being able to plug Copilot into everything that I'm doing, working through emails. <laughs> Michael, you spoke about the summarize this email string many, many <laughs> weeks ago, and that thing has become, I'm going to wear that button up very quickly, I can see. Um, but the intelligence behind Copilot is just phenomenal. The way it is able to interrogate everything within the Microsoft ecosystem to give you a holistic view, it's quite phenomenal. And I'm only scratching the surface at the moment, but I've seen how deep that goes. Um, there's, you know, you touched on the 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 bot that we've done, built in the website and how Copilot could even plug into that to start interrogating the the questions and the types of responses that it's bringing out and how that could augment what we're doing. Yeah, I think the the opportunities the opportunities are really endless here. Um, within uh, Teams, it's just revolutionised how uh, the workload of meetings having six or seven hours of meetings a day and being able to very rapidly get a summary of the day from those meetings without anything more than a few pushes of a button um, is quite phenomenal. So yeah, I, I see great things for, for Copilot integration into, into everything that we're doing. Beyond that, I think the power of, of AI and Gen AI is absolutely endless. So exciting times, very exciting. Oh, that's impressive, Damien. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and I mean, given all of this, right, Michael, um, I, I guess the question for you is, and, and that's something that I'm also wondering, right, for for developers is if they want to get started with, with some of these tools and some of the things that you mentioned, what would you recommend as an upskilling path for for people? Like, where, where do they start? Well, for developers, or specifically Microsoft developers, I would just head over to Microsoft Learn. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, I mean, your Azure Open AI stuff. There's all the Azure Studio. There are a ton of development tools. I mean, they're good to go. So I would say just head over to Microsoft Learn. But other advice is please don't get caught into in what they call tutorial hell, where you're just trying to learn everything. You're trying to learn the machine learning, the data science, and Python, and everything else. Start with the tech that you're comfortable in and just take baby steps. Um, I would suggest uh, YouTube is a great place. Lots of four minute videos as I tend not to watch them if they're longer than five minutes and just get these little bite sized chunks of information. Um, obviously, you follow things like your the, the Microsoft stand up um, uh, video sessions, but just start getting little bits and pieces. I mean, I've been working on this thing flat out for over a year now. And I'm still only now getting grips to all the moving parts of different technologies. 
there's a whole new breed of databases involved. But yeah, just uh, just take it slowly, and uh, rest assured you'll get there. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, I want to see if there are any more questions. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. But another question I had, Michael, is is around potential risks and, and challenges um, of of using such tools, right? So if 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 I'm a decision maker in an organization and my developers are coming to me and they're saying, hey, look, we'd love to utilize these tools. Um, they're going to increase our productivity, give us a competitive advantage. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be concerned. I'm going to be thinking, man, hang on a second. We, we're implementing these things that they've been tried and tested. Like, what are the potential risks and challenges that one needs to think about before embarking on, on such a journey? As I say, with, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So as with any development tool, you do want to vet the tools that you use, whether it's Copilot or anything else. Now, Microsoft, which is the, the area that I play in the most, they have a very extensive um, responsibility uh, program around AI and its use. Um, there are a lot of problems with AI models, um, specifically around bias and how they're set up. They can make mistakes. And in fact, if you look at most of your chat GPT windows, there'll be a little disclaimer right there in front of you, is AI can make mistakes, uh, especially for developers. Just make sure that um, you're not trying to get it to do all your work. Is When I use it, I have very specific questions. I'll obviously go and test all that code. Is You don't want a copy and paste mentality where you're just blindly accepting what the AI is telling you and pasting that into your code. You do need to understand all these fundamental technologies yourself. But on the increase in productivity, I was asked a question, say a project takes 100 hours. And I didn't have Copilot before. I have Copilot now is how long would that project still take you? Um, so you really have to sit and quantify what is this tool going to help? For me, it hasn't been a time saver. It's been a quality improver. Um, so it's just obviously it'll be different from company to company depending on what people are trying to do. But any statement around AI, whether this tool will help us, it'll be good for this, good for that, that just must be backed by evidence and properly quantified and obviously go through um, a proper due diligence process before yeah. you acquire it. But that applies really to any tool, not just AI tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And and maybe one last question from my side, just based on, on what you said just now, right? So you mentioned quite a number of things around accuracy, around quality. So, so I just wanted to know, how does one vet that? How does one ensure that what this, the code that's been spit out or the answer that's been given, that that, that is actually accurate? So for someone like you, it might be easy because you, you're quite experienced. You've worked with a lot of code and worked across different projects so you've got the experience and you can easily vet it but for somebody that's inexperienced right how do they ensure that this what they're getting is is actually accurate so for me obviously i do a lot of work in in research as well so you need to have some sort of grounding let's say out of ai and if you're talking specifically microsoft takes a c sharp is all of that is very well documented um, I mean, you get textbooks, you can go to the website, there are C-sharp patterns and practices. There's a lot of design patterns, so very industry proven stuff out there. Unfortunately, if you don't have that foundational knowledge or the basics, I don't think AI is going to make you much of a better developer. You can certainly pull the wool over a lot of people's eyes for a certain amount of time. But ultimately, if you're going beyond your, your, your basic mom and pop, type business applications and you move into my world of enterprise grade applications, that code is going to fall down flat unless you know the fundamentals. So like I say, whenever you need to start using an AI model, you must have some sort of foundational knowledge, um, some sort of a baseline that you can compare it to. Um, but that said, I do think it's getting better and better. And as we progress to this realm of AI supervisors, but uh, that might change, but we're not quite there yet. So developers, please obviously continue to learn, uh, learn about your databases, all your your good patterns and practices and principles, because we are most definitely going to need those for a very long time to come. Thanks, Michael. And that sounds like a very good uh, 
parting shot as well. So thank you.